Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this evening's Bible study. We praise your name for what you've been teaching us since we started this series. And we pray that today again you open our eyes of understanding so we'll be able to understand this practical aspect of our Christian life in Jesus' name. Be with us, O Lord, throughout this study. In Jesus' name I pray. Today we'll still continue with a special series. Actually, it's a special part of a special series. The series itself concerns studies of eternal consequence. And I've dealt with a part of that in a series of studies on evangelism. And I'm dealing with this part on marriage for singles. And I did emphasize before that even though we're talking about marriage for singles, everyone needs it. Our old members who have got married, you settled in homes and families, you're now bearing children, and we are rejoicing with you that what you learned years ago is now being beneficial to you. But then you need to remember all these things that we're learning, though you know a lot of these things before, because you are now the people that the church and God depend upon to counsel and to lead and to help the people that are coming behind. And therefore, you need all these studies yourself, though you have got married. Not only that, your own children will soon be growing up in the Lord, as well as growing up in age. And you are the best counselors and teachers for your own children. When they come to the age they are thinking about marriage, you will be able to see them down with experience and knowledge to tell them, this is the way you will go. And this is the way the Lord led us together, daddy and mommy, many, many years ago. Then you lay line upon line for them. They'll have deeper respect for you, deeper appreciation for you. One, because you are parents, and two, because you are not just ordinary parents, you are godly parents who know the word of God to direct the children. Then our workers, counselors, coordinators, and zonal leaders, and other categories of leaders and workers. Even if you have married, you need a lot of the things that we're teaching because a lot of people are coming into the church who are very new and they come in large, large numbers. And a pastor cannot touch and reach everyone. And not everyone is at the Bible study on Monday. And the church depends upon you that what you have learned here, you'll be able to transfer to those converts and believers, members in the church so that they, through you, will get the benefit of the studies on marriage for singles. Now the people that all eyes are watching, and we are all here because of you, and the special series is because of you. You are a Christian, you are not married yet, and you are eagerly waiting for every word I will speak, every sentence that I will say. You do not want to allow anything to fall to the ground. You need everything we are saying, so pay attention. Today I'm considering God's partner for your life. In preparation for another study I'm going to give you next week, simple, basic, definite steps on how to design the perfect will of God. But today, God's partner for your life. Each person thinking about marriage should understand that marriage is only for matured adults. A physical, emotional, social, spiritual maturity contributes tremendously to our marital lives. You see, there are many people that only think about physical maturity. In fact, I'm sorry to say, some of our parents, I mean our natural parents, they only think about our physical maturity. They say, don't you know how old you are now? Don't you see yourself in the mirror? Don't you see that you are physically matured? What are you thinking about marriage? They do not know anything about emotional stability. They do not know anything about temperamental development. Neither do they understand about our social interaction, about the way we relate, the thing that makes us different from animals, and then the spiritual maturity, how we're able to cope with life, how we're able to dig a deep foundation for a solid life, and you're able to build your life on the seven pillars of the Christian faith. They do not know all about that, and because of that, they think that once you're, spirit, once you're physically matured, you must be ready for marriage. But before you go into marriage, we need to develop a matured life of discipline and temperance, self-control or self-restraint. 
and self-denial and unselfishness as well as industry and diligence. In Proverbs, I read a lot of Proverbs to you last Monday and you, you should take time to read the Proverbs. Let me remind you that God asked Solomon and he said, what do you want that I do for you? And Solomon said, you have made me a king over the land of Israel and I am young I do not have the understanding and the wisdom a lot of administration that goes into leading the millions of Israelites I do not have a lot of the social development that I need in dealing with the problems of human beings I do not have a lot of understanding on dealing with the counselors that lived with my father old old men now that my father has died dealing with those old men aged men counselors people that even sat on the same seat in the palace with Ahithophel I do not have therefore Lord beyond money beyond material things give me wisdom and understanding and God said I'll give you wisdom and understanding such as no other king had had before you and then when God gave Solomon all that wisdom he recorded much of the wisdom he learned in the proverbs and much of what you read in the proverbs will just be the wisdom that god gave him to understand righteous people and wicked people how to deal with people how to deal with men how to deal with women how to develop in your own life how to live a life in the practical sense and it's not just talking about getting saved and going to heaven it's talking about how to live your life now satisfactorily, profitably, before you get to heaven. And remember, he wrote all this by the wisdom that God gave unto him. And as young people thinking about marriage, thinking about life, wanting to develop, you need to read the Proverbs. In fact, many, many years ago, when we used to go about in Scripture Union, preaching the gospel, and having camps with those children, I know one of the preachers that I respected very much at that time, I'm talking about 20 years ago now, or even more. You know what he will say? He will say that he, he wanted all of us, the preachers in Scripture Union and the students of the scripture, at the Scripture Union, to pick up one chapter of Proverbs every day. 31 chapters, just read a chapter a day. And if you have 30 days in that month, get two chapters just in one day of the last day. And then you read Proverbs every month. If you do that, you'll be so wise, you'll be wiser than your age. And it's good to study the Proverbs and to understand that much has been preserved for us in the book of Proverbs. But today again, let me just read a few verses to you. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6, go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth a meat in the summer, and gathereth her fruit, her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? What I'm showing you from here is that if you are going to live a normal life eventually, a good profitable developed family life you need to get out of bed you see when you are resting if you only eat and sleep you can grow physically but except you come out of bed you come out of sleep you interact you deal with other people you play with other people you serve with other people and you learn from other people you talk to other people they also talk to you if you do not do that you're not going to develop but if you want to grow and develop, come out of the shelter. You see, when you come out, there is storm outside. There is storm in life. There are conditions of life. There are circumstances in life. There are difficulties in life. Those are the difficulties out of the room, out of the shelter, out of bed that develops you. And when you are developed like that, you are getting matured for life. And then in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. Proverbs 20, 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Although that passage is talking about industry and diligence at work, but apply it to your life. Love not sleep. Do not just remain in the shelter. Come out, 
meet with the other people. And when you do, open your eyes. There is a lot to learn. A lot to learn. And many times, what you learn at school from the books is not enough. But when you get on the bus, people push you. And before you learn how to live with people, you push them too. Other people sit down. You struggle to sit down. You are being exposed to life. But you see, for all the time, you are in the bed. After getting out of bed, you go into an air-conditioned car. After getting out of that, a carpet is stretched before you. Then you walk into a carpeted place. You never suffer. You never see any problem. You are not prepared for marriage. But you have come out into the public. You have interacted. You are developing socially. You are developing mentally. You are developing spiritually. You are developing in interaction with brothers and sisters. And you are developing also in academic things. Eventually you will find that you are matured. All around to be able to deal with the problems of marriage. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 21. For three things the earth is disquieted. And for four which it cannot bear. Here, the wise man, another wise man said, There are three things. Oh yes, he said, I remember the fourth thing now. For which there is disquietness in the world. And then he mentions the four things. Number one, a servant when he reigneth. You know what I've been telling you? A servant develops in only one area. He works. In those days, he can till the ground. He can plant the seed. He can sweep the floor. He can cook in the kitchen. He can carry a load. But the servant lived a lonely life. Their masters did not allow them to go out and be exposed and have experience. If eventually that servant becomes a king and he reigns, the country, the land, the earth is not in peace. Because he doesn't have the experience. He has only developed his muscles, but not his mind. He has only developed his bones, but he has not developed on the wisdom to deal with people. And then he says, And a fool, when, is, when he is filled with meat. A fool. Who is a fool? A fool is somebody who has not developed enough to know that there is life tomorrow morning. He says, All we have today, let us eat and drink. Because when the night has come, we don't know, life may not even come tomorrow. So let's finish everything that we have today. My brothers and sisters, I knew a brother like that. Child of God. Real wonderful child of God. In our own church here. Oh, you say, do you have people like that in your church? Yes, we do. We have all types of people. We're all growing. All growing. Maybe you are even like that yourself. Now let me tell you, this brother was living with another brother. And he likes to eat. And he can eat four times a day. And if the other brother said, watch out, because tomorrow, oh, he will say, Jesus may come tonight. And then if he has any amount of money, and then he's spending. And the other brother said, how about next week? Ah, don't you believe God? Jesus may come this week. There are people like that. They have developed doctrine. They have not developed wisdom. They know Bible passage about heaven. They don't know any Bible passage about how to live now. They understand revelation. They do not understand proverbs. And it says, A fool when his belly is filled with meat, that the earth is disquieted. And therefore we need to understand that we must not remain fools. We must learn. For an odious woman when she is married. What type of woman is that? That's the woman that is now of age and the mother said don't you see yourself in the mirror don't you see you are well developed don't you see that you are now ready for marriage but that girl even though 25 her mind her brain her intellect her way of thinking her action her behavior is like five-year-old girl body has developed mind has not developed the body has developed but the spirit has not developed the body has developed, but social relationship, interaction, how to deal with others has not been developed. That is like an odious woman. When she's married, there is trouble everywhere. And an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. What does that mean? You know, all the time the mistress, that's the real wife, had been doing budgeting and buying. Had been doing planning and cleaning. 
had been doing the timetable and then just giving instruction to the handmaid, saying, cook this, will measure out the recipe, will say a pint of this, a cup of this, a drop of this, and just a sprinkle of this, and will explain everything. But the maid never bothered, never checked out how the mistress actually did all those things. Maybe eventually the mistress died. And this old man felt, why go out and marry somebody else? This maid that had been here all the time, when my real wife was still alive. Well, the maid, in any case, since you don't have husband, what do you think about it? Can you be my wife? And the maid said, jolly well. That's the greatest surprise of my life. So I'm your wife now. And the man said, yes. And there's trouble in the world. The lady does not know about budgeting. She was only a maid. She doesn't know about buying. She was only a maid. She doesn't know about communication. She was only a maid. Because of the relationship he had had before, master-slave relationship, and she never developed. All she developed was sitting at the kitchen and grinding that pepper she can grind for five hours. But she doesn't know how to keep things clean, how to get things orderly, how to do any other thing. She developed physically as a maid, as a slave, but she didn't develop spiritually and socially and intellectually. When such a person that is not balanced, not well developed, not fully developed, when such a person gets married, there is problem, there is unrest. And so that is the reason we're thinking and talking about all this. That before we get married, there should be this maturity. Physical, you know the physical maturity will take care of itself. If you just eat and exercise and sleep and work, physical development will take care of itself. But emotional development. My brothers, think about this. There are people that whenever you rebuke them, the only thing they know is to cry like when they were a baby. That's the way they still cry at 25, at 26. The emotion is not developed. There are people whenever you tell them, why are you sitting there? Now stand up and go and sit over there. That person, she will stand up from that place and then sit down in that place. For the next six hours, she will not talk. She is thinking, nobody loves me. I sat down there, they told me to rise up. And then she is weeping. And you, you told the person to rise up 30 minutes ago, you had forgotten. And you are very happy, you are socially developed. And you went to the person and said, ah, my sister, what's the matter? Well, I know nobody loves me. And begins to cry. What's the matter? She is developed physically, emotionally. She is not developed. The temperament is not developed. Or it is spiritual. That she reads a verse of scripture. She doesn't know what it means. And if you have children, she is not going to be able to explain anything to the children. And so, there is maturity necessary to help us in our marriages. Some people recklessly or suddenly enter into marriage. And thereby they ruin their lives. They mistake their dangerous presumption for daring faith. They want to get married now, and they will think about converting that partner later. Such people blindly enter into a life of misery. Others go into marriage to stop, to solve a present, pressing problem, or just to change the environment. They want to escape from their parental control. Or they say, if I get married, I will enjoy my life. Mommy and daddy will not be telling me, go to the kitchen. Go and sweep the ground, put that bucket of water in the toilet, and flush that toilet. All these clothes are dirty, a pile, a mountain of clothes, every Saturday. All the ones that your junior wants to use, your father used, your mother used, everybody used, they put a mountain there. They say, now settle all that. And you say, but I want to read Bible. They say, well, read the Bible, but finish all that. And when you finish, we hope that you finish all that uh, clothing by... 12 o'clock, so everything will be dried up. And by 4 o'clock, between 4 and 8, iron everything, make sure everything is neat. And while you are washing the clothes, you are crying. And saying, well, one day is one day I will marry. And when you marry, there will be no washing of clothes. One day will be one day I will get out of this parental control. And I will be free. And then eventually she gets married. And she realizes that the man too has been thinking, all this clothes I'm washing, one day I will get married. And eventually, both of them, they get married. You'll be counseling them every week. They will see the pastor, they will see the coordinator, they will see the zonal leader, they will see the woman representative. They will have to go to heaven and see God. You see, we should develop. 
And you should not just run out of parental control, just run into marriage thinking that if I get married, then life will be easier. You may create a set of problems for yourself. There are people that get married only for the physical pleasure. Now listen to me. There are people that think, if I get married, I will satisfy my fleshly desire every time I want to. And just for the sake of that physical gratification, that's the way, that's the reason they rush into marriage. But when you get into marriage, you realize that the physical gratification of the flesh does not take up to 1% of the marriage. Not up to 1%. There are 24 hours of the day. And you cannot spend 1% of that time in physical gratification within the marriage. There are 168 hours in every week. You cannot spend 1% of all that time in physical gratification of the flesh. And if you rush into marriage just because of physical gratification, you become frustrated after the marriage. And the man is like, you know, the type of person that she does, he doesn't care about the wife while the wife is working at the kitchen, while the wife is mopping the floor, while the wife is doing any other thing. He doesn't even know that there's a woman in the house. Only when the body is wanting some satisfaction will say, are you there? I need you now, 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 now. Out of the kitchen, let me wash my hand. No, I'm in a hurry. Don't wash your hand. And then after the physical gratification, we'll push her away. Go and be doing what you were doing before. I don't want to see you now. I'm all right now. That's not marriage. That's jungle life. One animal living with a human being. The lion and the lamb. And it doesn't work. Marriage is not just physical gratification. If you do that in your marriage, all everything you will get will be a master-slave relationship. That's why everyone needs to be thoughtful and prayerful before taking the final decision as to the choice of a life partner. Now today we're considering three points in particular. Number one, perplexity on the single status. Number two, preparation for satisfactory selection. Number three, perception of spiritual guidance. Now let's look at this first one. Matthew chapter 19. From verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Jesus had just described a situation in marriage. And then the disciples came to him and they said, Lord, if the case of a man with his wife be like this, one man, one woman, until death do us part, then it is not good to marry. There are people that do not understand the single life, the unmarried stage. They remain single. They remain unmarried. Because they do not understand why they are taking the decisions they are taking. They have heard about problems. They are trying to avoid problems. They have heard about difficulties in those pe other people that have got married. They are trying to avoid those difficulties. Now, my sister, you are a prayer partner with another sister. And eventually that other sister, older than yourself, your prayer partner, she got married. And after that marriage, three months after, you asked her, my sister, how are you? How is the marriage now? And the sister said, well, I don't know where to start. Well, tell me, how is the marriage? You know, no freedom now. I wake up in the morning. I cannot read the Bible for many hours like I used to do when we were prayer partners together. The man wants to go to the place of work and I begin to cook. And then he comes back. Before he comes back, I must have been back at home so as to take care of him. And sometimes when I cook a particular type of food, I'll spend hours. I put it on the table. The man rises up and says, I'm sorry. I don't want to eat that. What I want is this. I go back to the kitchen again. And at the end of the day, the pile of, uh, of plates, they're like this, a mountain in the kitchen. You know what we used to do, my prayer partner? All those days, I can just soak that thing there for hours and even for days. My husband doesn't allow that. It's difficult getting married. And you young fellow, you say, is that marriage? Let me go and pray. God, give me the grace I will never marry. I dedicate my life to you. Lord, when I see man, I run. I will serve you. If the case of a woman be like this, don't let me marry. You know, that's how some people behave. Because they have heard of difficulties. 
normal things in the lives of other people in marriage. Because of that, they are running away from marriage. That's why these disciples came to the Lord and they said, If the case of a man be like this, it is not good to marry. But Jesus stopped them. He cautioned them. Verse 11, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive the same, save to whom it is given. For there are you who are so born from their mother's womb. Now my brothers and sisters, don't copy anybody. You might see a man, and that man is getting older and older and older. And a man is not married yet. And a man is not going to tell you his problem. But Jesus said, there are people that have genetic infertility. That is, they are impotent. That's the way they were born, as men. And they know that because they have this incompleteness biologically, they know that they are not to go into marriage. And you see them, they are not going to announce their problems over the loudspeaker in the church. They are not going to even tell their closest friend that they were born impotent and a eunuch. And therefore, if you are saying, I am waiting for brother so-and-so, he's my hero. I love him. I like his spiritual life. When he quotes the Bible, when he preaches, when he prays, I like him. And he has not got married, so why should I think about marriage now? But you don't know about brother so-and-so. Maybe there is one reason or the other. There are women that also are not biologically complete. And the female part of them had not been fully developed. And without that development physically, they cannot go into marriage because part of the thing that makes marriage what marriage is is not present in their bodies. And because of that, they're still praying, watching and waiting for a miracle. And you might be a sister and you might say, you know, sister so-and-so, dedicated and very, very loving and very, very spiritual and working for God and winning many, many souls to the Lord. I just like to be like her. And since she is not married, why am I thinking about marriage? But you know what Jesus said? He said, all men cannot receive this, save they to whom it is given. For some, there are some that were so born from their mother's womb. And then it says, and there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men. And then it says, and there are eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. There are people that do not have any desire any desire of the flesh to satisfy like you know in your body you get hungry when you get hungry you know that you ought to eat you get thirsty you know that you ought to drink water and then you have other desires that you only can fulfill legitimately in marriage but there are some people that god has given has given them the gift of celibacy and the gift to contain they do not have temptation or desire or longing towards the satisfaction of the body in that sense. And God has given them a ministry like Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. He had such a gift. He said, I would all men like one myself. But then he said, everyone has his proper gift. First Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7. From verse 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I said therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they be even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. That means then that those who have the calling, it's a calling, like the calling for Paul like Jeremiah, like Elijah. If you have that calling, then God will convince you by revelation and by giving you a fulfilling ministry. And so let no one just say, well, I will remain single because of the frustration I've got before, because I'm tired of praying. I've had the repeated disappointments. And then there are some imaginary fears. Other people lack funds. Other people are just unwilling to share their lives with another or they have some temporary fulfillment and satisfaction in a single state. Because of that, they want to remain single. Find out the calling of God for your life. The majority of people will get married. Because the majority of people do not have the lifestyle and the ministry and the calling of people like Jeremiah, people like Elijah, people like Paul. And so those who will get married, 
You have to find out the will of God. Do not be afraid. You heard about John Wesley last week. And you said, ah, if John Wesley made such a mistake, how am I sure about myself? Let me remain single. You heard about William Carey last week. If William Carey made such a mistake in marriage, how can I be sure about myself? Trust in God. Believe in God. God will show you his perfect way. Now point number two. Preparation for satisfactory selection. We need preparation before we can actually have a satisfactory selection and a fulfilling marriage. The selection I'm talking about now is a selection of a husband and a selection of a wife. Oh, you said, but I thought we talk about the will of God. Yes, that's what we're saying. In that will of God, God will reveal somebody to you. But you know, God is not going to come and make that selection himself. And then bring that person to you. God is going to reveal his mind to you. His will to you. And then you will need wisdom and understanding to know how to go to that revealed will. Talk to that revealed will. And that person too will have to pray. And eventually the selection is done by you, by the leading of God. But what are the preparations you need? Look at Luke chapter 14. From verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Less happily, after he had laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it, begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. The Lord wants us to prepare and to plan. In fact, we used to say, even as some believers, when we're very, very young, look before you live. Think before you act. Prepare before you build. And so if we're going to have successful marriage and satisfactory selection, there is need for preparation. You need to dig the foundation deep if you are going to build a solid house. Beware of pressure from yourself or from others. Uh, now I want you to think about your life for a moment. I want to, I'm saying this to help you. Some of the decisions you have taken under pressure eventually made you to suffer. You know, somebody came to you and he said, buy this now, now. You need it. You say, let me think about it. Then he put pressure on you. And then some ideas that are suggested to you became a pressure on you. And you took a decision. Eventually it became a foolish decision. Pressure is not good. Especially in marriage. Do not yield to the pressures of other people or the pleasures or the pressure of your own body. Do not rush into marriage without God's leading. Determine God's purpose in your life and get eternity into proper focus in your thinking. God's purpose and God's choice in marriage will not contradict or hinder His previously revealed plan for your life. Determine the plan of God for your life. And then any other thing you do after that, make sure that it tallies, it agrees with every other thing you're doing. Let me use the example of education. Since I was in primary school, I wasn't even born again. But you know, I was religious. And I used to pray. And I used to find out the mind of God and the will of God. And as far back as 1952, I was in standard two. We took exam because you had to take a special exam to go into standard three, which was in another place because the school I was then ended in standard two. And then you take this special exam, you go to standard three in another place. After taking the exam, I wanted to know whether I will pass or not. You know what I did? I prayed. I said, God, I looked up to heaven. Nobody taught me to look up to heaven. I just knew that God is somewhere far away there. And I knew that even though I was talking quietly, that God will hear because he's almighty God. I knew that he covered everywhere. Anywhere you look in the sky, God is behind that spot. If you look here, God is behind that spot. And I knew that if I look up there, God will just look at me. He will see me even though I could not see him. I knew that in 1952. 
And I said, God, if I will pass this exam, tell me. And then I took a piece of um, broken pot. And I spit it on one side to make it wet. And the other part was dry. I said, God, listen to me. I will throw this thing up. If this wet part comes up, I will pass that exam. And I said, God, don't leave me alone. Don't disappoint me. No, my friends were not there. I did all privately myself. And I threw it up, and the white side came up. I said, God, I thank you. I passed the exam. And you know, I passed the exam. I wasn't born again. But I read in the Bible that God will lead and direct his own. And then, that's how I decided, what will I do in life? And God gave me this impression that I will be a teacher. And every time, from the primary school, I started telling other people, you know, I will be a teacher. I wasn't interested in being a doctor, being an engineer, being a driver, being any other person, just a teacher. And then I will take a whip in my hand. When going in the farm on, sat on the farm on Saturday, all the leaves on the side of the road, I say, stretch out your hand. And I beat all those leaves as a teacher because that's what I thought teachers did. But the point is this. When I got to secondary school and I wanted to choose subjects, I had known long, long ago I will be a teacher. Because of that, I chose subjects that I would like to teach. And then, eventually, when I was going to do my A-level, I chose subjects I would like to teach. The question is this. Since I'm going to be a teacher, what subject would I like to teach? Then I chose them. Then when I needed to narrow down again, what subject did I like very, very much to teach? I chose those subjects. That's what I applied. Even after I was born again, it didn't cancel what I knew in the primary school. I will be a teacher. You see, the previously revealed will of God in my life now affected my choice of subjects. The same thing in marriage. The previously revealed will of God in your life, what your total life will be, what your whole life will be, what the perfect life that God wanted you to live will be. Now, that's the revealed will of God that you knew before. Your marriage now must not contradict that. And so that's how to get prepared. Determine the will of God for your life. Determine the plan of God for your life. And then the marriage will support it and complement it and help in that will of God. Now to know the will of God, let's talk about seven things that you need. Number one, do the will of God which is already revealed unto you. The will of God which is already revealed unto you. Let me tell you how God acts and how God works. When God reveals something to you, if you do it, then God will reveal another thing. If you do that, God will reveal another thing. Take the life of Moses. The Lord met him. And he said, throw that rod down. It became a serpent. It would not have become a serpent in his hand if he didn't throw it down. Pick it up. It became a rod again. If he did not pick it up because of fear, it would not have become a rod again. God will act after you are first taking the first step that you have done what he told you to do. And in all the Bible, you can see that that is how God acts. Look at the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent them out two by two. They came back. After they came back, he began to reveal more unto them. And there was a time he told them that there are many things I should have told you, but I cannot tell you now because you cannot bear them now. Do the one I've revealed to you first. After that, the other thing will come. And so if you are seeking the will of God in marriage, how do you do it? Do the will of God revealed already in your life. If God tells you, help that individual. That's the will of God. Do that. Then the other will of God will come in. Number two. Pray with faith in the faithful God. And constantly be open to God. You know, my brothers and sisters, there are people that feel that if God is going to talk about marriage to them, about that selection to them, about the choice. If God is going to say anything, he will say it in the church. But God also talks to his people outside the church. Other people think, oh yes, when I am sleeping and I'm dreaming, God will talk to me. Yes, but God also talks outside the dream. Other people think, when I am praying, with my prayer partner, God will speak. Oh yes, but sometimes God speaks when you are not praying. After you have finished the prayer, he might speak to you while in the bus. 
he might reveal his mind and his will to you while you are entering your place of work. He might reveal his will to you while you are sitting down and listening to the word of God like this. Therefore pray in faith to the faithful God and keep open to the Lord. You remember the case of Peter? God, Christ had told them, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. In short, you will be witnesses unto me, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And they had been preaching to the Jews. Now it was time to fulfill the great commission and reach out to Cornelius. Where did God reveal his will? And when was that? Was that when Peter was thinking about the Gentiles? Thinking about the uttermost part of the earth? Not at all. Peter was hungry. And he went to the top of the house and he prayed. After the prayer, he wasn't expecting the great commission and the fulfillment of that great commission to the Gentiles at all. And then the sheets came down and the voice said, Arise, kill and eat. And he said, No. You see, he didn't know that that was the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 28, of Mark chapter 16, and of Luke chapter 24, and of what a minister was telling you here tonight in reaching out and preaching the gospel. He didn't know that was a fulfillment. He didn't know that was the fulfillment of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And he said, no, I will not do it. And while he was thinking about this, good enough he thought about it. So these three people came, and the voice of the Spirit of God said, They're looking for you. I sent them. Go with them. You see, the Lord can reveal His will to you at any time. So pray to the faithful God and remain open. Number three, learn to be neutral. It's difficult, very difficult, but learn to be neutral. Why did I say it's difficult to be neutral? You see, all of life, since we are very, very young, you have been molded to think in a particular direction. You as a brother and as a sister coming from the eastern part of our country. Since you are very, very young, your mother, your father, your relatives, your uncle, your cousin had been telling you, you will grow old, you are going into life, you are going to the city, you are going to school, you'll meet a lot of people. But remember, our family never marries outside this village. And they have been dinning that into your ears from when you are very, very young. That's why it becomes difficult to be neutral. But you must be neutral. Not only that, in the secondary school, you, uh, when you were a boy with other boys, when you were playing and talking together just like unbeliever, but you didn't know they were, they were molding your life. You know, they were saying, when I grow old, I will marry a tall lady, a firm, brisk person that's smart, and slim and then they repeated that all the time eventually even after you became a christian all that you are thinking about oh lord i'm thinking about marriage tall slim smart sharp walking briskly that's what you are thinking and you are not neutral at other times already you who are women i don't know how it got into your mind but you just think that if a man is like Esau, all airy, air at the forehead, air at the heel, hair on the palm, air all over his body. You just think that that's a real man, that's a man, a guy. But how did it come to your mind? You didn't know how it came to your mind. Therefore, as you now became a Christian unconsciously, you began to think, now that I'm thinking about marriage, I want a man that is very, very airy like Esau. At the heel, at the forehead, I want air all over there. You are not neutral. But if you are going to get married and know the will of God, you need to be neutral so that you do not have an idol in your heart. You remain in the stage of neutrality so you can perceive and receive and accept the will of God when it comes. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Shall I be inquired of at all by them? 
we need neutrality. God knows well who you are, and he knows well who will fit into your life. Number four, get rid of worldly attitude. Look through the eyes of the Spirit. Do not have any worldly attitude. When I was in secondary school, we used to have some boys in our class. And we refer to them as Lagos boys. Every time, the school uniform was very, very neat. Not only that, that was the age and the time. I'm talking about the late 50s now. That was the age and the time when they would put starch in the collar. And they would stretch it up. It was, it was very, very hard. They pressed it. That's all they did at school. And in the dormitory, whenever we were in the dormitory, those of us who didn't want, you know, all those things, we just studied mathematics and chemistry and physics and English and literature. But these people, they never did, they never, uh, did any assignment. All they would be doing was ironing their clothes. They ironed every day. And then they came out. When they came out, all the girls, I went to a co-educational school, boys and girls studying together. All those girls, they never looked at us who were studying mathematics and chemistry because we had no starch in our color. But the people that had starch in their color, oh, they looked at them and they were choosing them. Those of us that didn't have any starch were, were not popular at all. All we had was mathematics and chemistry and physics and English. But eventually... All the people that had starch in their color, they didn't have any other thing. No certificate. Those of us that did not have any starch, we had certificate. After getting certificate, they're still selling starch in the market. If I want all the starch I want now, I can go for it. But you see, the point is this. All those girls in our school, they were looking with fleshly eyes, looking for starch. Are you there looking for starch? Walk with spiritual eyesight. That's the point I'm making. And see the way the Spirit of God is seen. Do not look for stature. Do not look for physical things. But look for something that God himself will appreciate and recommend. I want you to look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So, don't look with worldly attitude. Look through the eyes of the Spirit. Number five, do not accept to marry someone you don't love on the basis of somebody else's dream or vision or prophecy. There are people that will say, well, I don't love that sister really, but since somebody prophesied to me that that's the person to marry, so I accept, I will marry her. Don't marry like that. Another person will say, I do not love that brother. I've even tried and prayed and did, done everything to love him. But I do not have any love for him. But I will marry him because somebody had a dream. Do not marry on the basis of another person's dream. Make up your mind yourself. At, according to the leading of God, don't let others choose for you. Number six, always insist on being spiritually compatible. Not just intellectually or physically compatible. Look at your spiritual life and see that the person that you say God is leading you to, you are spiritually compatible. Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. And it's in verse 3. Amos 3, 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Let's say you are a man. Your heart is in the work of the Lord. Your affections are set on things on high. Then here is another sister. She is a Christian, a real child of God. But on the other hand, her mind is totally set on education and business practice. You eventually want to become a missionary. Or you eventually, you believe the Lord wants you to be a pastor. Preaching and praying and ministering to other people. And this other fellow feels that she's, a, she's going to be a businesswoman. Running from London to Nigeria to America to Japan to Tokyo. Almost everywhere all over the world. You see, you are not spiritually compatible. There is this other sister that just loves the Lord. Your affections are set on things on earth. And the things of the world you take with a loose hand, a moderate hand. But this other man, a believer... 
But then he's so much fond of his project in life. Today he's in Cardona. He comes back to Lagos. When he comes back to Lagos, he spends only two days. Then he, want, he goes to Calabar. After coming back one week, his business takes him again. He goes to Kano. After coming back, he spends a day. Then he goes to Enugum. After coming back, he spends one hour. He says, I must catch the next flight now. And then he goes to uh, Onicha. And you are a family person. You like to stay in the family and take care of your husband and take care of the children and read the Bible and have family devotion and come to the church together and think about how you are going to evangelize and lead our fellowship together. The man is a man of the road. You are a woman of the home. You are not compatible. And so if you are going to get married, as you are seeking the will of God, you must make sure that there is compatibility spiritually, not just intellectually and not just physically. And then number seven, keep on preparing and growing to greater maturity while praying and waiting to know God's will and God's choice for your life. Now, perception is spiritual guidance. What do I mean by this? There are people that God has been revealing His will to and yet they have not seen it. God has revealed to them, but they didn't understand it. They are real children of God, and the voice of God has been very, very clear, but yet they cannot understand and discern what God is saying. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, from verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time, that Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Ere the Lamb of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. You see, God was calling Samuel. God's voice was clear and distinct. But Samuel thought it was another's voice. Think about the confusion. God perfect. Eli imperfect. God pure. Eli impure. God divine. Eli human. God omnipotent. Eli limited. And yet, Samuel mistook the voice of God. For the voice of Eli. You know, it can happen to a believer like that. That God is speaking to you. And you say, well, maybe my mind is talking to me. I don't think that is God. And God has called you once. And he has pointed out who to marry. And yet, you didn't catch it. That's why I said some weeks ago. And I'm saying it again. You need our coordinators. Our zonal leaders. Our leaders who are representatives of different sections our women representatives, and all others who may not even be in that category of leadership, but they are matured in the Lord and they are in the church. That you need to talk to, so that if God has been talking to you, God has been calling you, God has been saying, that is he, that is she, then if you didn't catch it, then the counselor, the interpreter, the person that is leading you, will be able to tell you, that's what God is saying, that's what God is saying. It's not going to dictate for you. The counselor is not going to tell you, you must marry that individual. But the counselor will be able to say, from what you say you are hearing, didn't you know Then he will open the verses of scripture to you? And it will open up in your heart. That's why we need counselors and interpreters. Look at Job chapter 9 and verse 11. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. There are many believers in that situation that the Lord already has revealed his will and his mind to you concerning marriage. And that person passed by you and God said very, very clearly and distinctly, look at her. And the person that God said look at is going in front. You look back and say, God, where is she? I didn't see anybody. The person is in the front, and, the person, and this fellow is looking back. And so God calls you the second time, like he called Samuel, in another situation, and said, My child, see. 
and the person went to the back at this time i was just going past by you and god said see and you look in front you look back the other time the person was in front now you look in front the person is at the back now he said god i didn't see anything you need a counselor samuel needed a counselor when god spoke samuel samuel he went to eli again samuel samuel he went to eli Again, Samuel, Samuel, he went to Eli. Then Eli began to counsel him. Next time, when you hear a voice like that, this is how to respond. This is how to reply. So we need to perceive, we need to understand God's guidance. I'll be saying much about it next week, but today I'm just telling you the necessity of a counselor. Job chapter 33, from verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. You see, many of the people that are saying they don't know God's will, it doesn't mean that God has not spoken to them. Many of the people that are saying, well, I am confused, I'm a child of God, I prayed and prayed and God didn't answer. It doesn't mean that God is not speaking to them, God is speaking to them, but they cannot understand, they cannot perceive. Look at that verse again. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep, falleth, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opened their ears, the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. In the dream, in the vision, one way or the other, God has been speaking to them, and yet they do not understand. Verse 23, if there be a messenger within, an interpreter, that means a counselor, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. If there be one counselor that you can find, some of our leaders, the people that have been listening to God, the people that have been understanding the directions and the directives of the Lord, that you can say, my brother, if you are a brother, I believe God has been speaking to me, but I'm missing it all the time. Can you help me? And the person will give you time. You sit him down or he sits you down. You relate to him all that God has been saying. And that counselor will be able to say, my brother, it looks as if God is very, very clear beyond the shadow of doubt. Or if you're a sister, you get another sister, you say, well, I don't know. That brother proposed to me and I prayed and prayed and prayed and, um, well, I don't know what God is saying. Then the sister that you are talking to will sit you down and say, okay, tell me your experiences. Tell me what God is saying. And then when you say everything, oh, the other sister will reply, it looks so simple. Look at this, look at this, look at this. And he opens up the mind of God for you. That's why we need one another, an interpreter, a counselor, a helper, a leader. In Luke chapter 24, and from verse 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. These people were talking about Jesus Christ. They wanted to see him. The apostles had gone to the graveside, to the sepulchre, and they came back to report that the Jesus is risen. Some of the women have come back to report that they saw angels these two people were confused and they said if we could see him ourselves that would be a lot better that one said he's risen that one said the sepulchre is empty that one said an angel spoke to him what is all this confusion we want to see jesus they were looking and jesus came and he said how are you there what are you talking they didn't know him that's the very person they're looking for and that person started talking to them and that person made the appearance they didn't recognize don't you know it's sometimes like that in marriage you have prayed you have prayed until your throat is dry and you don't know how to pray again you say god i've tried my best even when i was praying for salvation i didn't pray as much as this even sanctification that other people have problems about i didn't pray as much as this i remember when i was baptized in the holy ghost i just prayed and god baptized me god why is getting a wife more difficult than getting salvation than getting sanctification than getting holy ghost baptism and god says it's not difficult 
and eventually the person you are looking for, the person comes to you. And God is saying, now, that's it. And you're still praying. And you're still saying, I'm confused. I don't understand. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I even fasted. And that is the person right there. And God is saying, well, I've done my part now. The rest is in the hand of a counselor. You see, that's why we need counseling. We need help. That even when God is revealing something, we'll be able to see and catch what God is revealing. Look at that same chapter in Bastati. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. You know, he was talking to them about Moses. About the writings of Moses and the Psalms and the prophet. They didn't know it was he. While he was talking to them, their hearts were burning within them. They said, never preacher preached like this before. Never a man spoke like this before. While he was talking to us in the way, didn't our heart burn? My friend, shouldn't you understand that this is the person you are looking for? Who could have been talking like this, going from Moses to the Psalms and to the prophet, and your heart is burning, and you're having the conviction and the illumination of the Holy Ghost, so much like this. Is this not the Jesus that the apostles said, the sepulchre is empty? They didn't see it. But eventually, when they sat at meat, and he wasn't preaching anymore now. He broke the bread and gave it to them. Immediately their eyes opened, their understanding opened, and then he vanished out of their sight. Our God is wonderful. The same thing in marriage. God will lead you. God will direct you. Next week I'll be talking on the simple, basic, definite steps on how you can determine and discern the very guidance and the will of God. Let's rise up and pray that whatever God has been saying, whatever God has been revealing, God will make everything clear beyond a shadow of doubt. Talk to the Lord in prayer that he will guide you, that he will lead you. And those of us who have got married, let's endeavor to understand all these things. That we may be able to help our fellow brothers and sisters that will come to us for counsel. Thank the Lord for making his word very clear. Thank the Lord. Believe the Lord. He will guide he will direct. He will not leave you alone. He loves you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never forget you. And when he speaks, endeavor to open up and to understand and accept what God is saying.